Note naming, everything you need to know so you don't fail music class in nine minutes. One of the most important skills in learning to read and write music is note naming. It's not unlike when you were learning to read and write. You had to learn the alphabet. The musical alphabet is a bit simpler because it's only seven letters long. Of course, there are way more than seven notes in music. In fact, on a full piano keyboard, there are 88 possible pitches, but each one is named for one of those seven letters. Let's spend a few moments getting familiar with the piano keyboard. Even if you're learning another instrument, the visual nature of the keyboard makes almost everything in music theory a little easier to demonstrate and understand. Although the piano can be a little intimidating at first glance, there's actually a pretty simple pattern to it. Notice that the black keys come in a repeating pattern of two and then three, over and over again. It's important to realize that any two notes that are in the same relative position in that pattern of white and black notes are going to have the same name and sound pretty similar, just higher or lower. If we zoom in, we can see that this key and this key are both in the same relative position in that pattern, as is this one and this one, and these two. And that means that people who have higher voices can sing up here. And people with lower voices can sing down here. And they can sing together and it's going to sound pretty good. And this applies across the entire keyboard. On the piano, most people orient themselves around C, which is the white key to the left of the pair of black keys. Then we can go forwards in the alphabet and name all the white notes. After C is D, E, F, G, A, and B. After that, we're back to C, which is always the one to the left of two black notes. Then the pattern just continues. Until you manage to memorize the keyboard, knowing just one note and counting up or down is a great shortcut. Next up is sharp notes and flat notes. Sharp notes are notated with this symbol, and it means to raise the note by a semitone. Flats use this symbol, which means to lower the note by a semitone. So, what's a semitone? It's just the direct next key on the piano, whether it's a black key or a white key. So this note is C, and if we go up a semitone, we get C sharp. Up a semitone from D is D sharp. This is F and F sharp, G and G sharp, and A and A sharp. For flats, this is D, and down a semitone is D flat. This is E, and this is E flat. This is G and G flat, A and A flat, and B and B flat. You'll notice that the black notes have two names because you can approach them from below or above. That phenomenon is known as enharmonic equivalent, which refers to the fact that some notes have more than one name. They're spelled differently, but sound the same. It's kind of like how some names have more than one spelling, like John, Mark, or Caitlin. Some of the white notes have two names too. For instance, this note is F, but it's also possible to call it E sharp because it's up a semitone from E. And this note is E, but it's sometimes called F flat because it's a semitone below F. Same for C, also known as B sharp, and B, also known as C flat. And that's how to name every note on the piano. Next, notation. Music is written on a special type of graph called a staff. Notes can come in a variety of shapes that indicate how long a note is, but it's the vertical position of a note on the staff that indicates what pitch is to be played. So, these are all different pitches, and these are all the same. Any of the 88 keys on the piano can be notated on the staff, but with only 11 possible positions, we need a way to give context to the staff. So, we use a symbol called a clef. The purpose of the clef is to let us know what part of the piano the staff is actually referring to. It's kind of like how a graph doesn't really mean anything unless we add labels to add context to the information displayed. Let's start with the treble clef. The bottom note of the treble clef is E, and every successive space or line goes to the next note in the musical alphabet. F, G, A, B, C, D, E, and F. If you have to go beyond the staff, we can add more lines called ledger lines, following the musical alphabet forwards. It works the same way if we want to go lower. We just go backwards in the alphabet. The bottom line is E, and below that is D, then C, B, A, G. There's really no limit to how many ledger lines you can use, but too many can become difficult to read, and it might be better to use a different clef, like the bass clef. Bass clef follows the same basic principles as treble clef, but lines up with the piano like this, so the notes are different. The bottom note of the bass clef is G. As you go up the staff, you get the next note in the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and A. To go higher, we just add more ledger lines above the staff following the musical alphabet forwards. And to go lower, we add ledger lines below the staff and follow the musical alphabet backwards. The third most commonly used clef is called the alto clef. It sits right in between the treble and bass clef. It has F as the lowest note, but otherwise works just like the treble and bass clef. There are several other clefs, but these three are the most common. 
Depending what instrument you play, you'll have to learn the note names for one or more of these clefs. There are basically three ways to remember your notes, and they all have their own pluses and minuses. The first one is the simplest. Just memorize them by rote. If you're a beginner, you're probably only learning a couple of notes at a time anyway, so it shouldn't be that hard to just memorize one or two notes every few sessions. The second way is to learn any one note on the staff and count up or down from there, just like we did on the piano. For instance, the bottom note is a good place to start. On treble clef, it's E. Alto clef starts on F, and the bottom note of the bass clef is G. Alternatively, you might find it useful to know that the treble, bass, and alto clefs are also known as the G clef, F clef, and C clefs. The shape of the treble clef is based on a stylized G, and also centers on and defines the note G. The bass clef shape is based on a stylized F, and the two dots surround and define the note F. The alto clef is centered on and defines the middle C of the piano. The third way is to use a mnemonic device, where the letters of a word or sentence remind you of the letter names of the lines or spaces. The easiest one is the spaces of the treble clef, because they spell out the word face. For the lines, a popular mnemonic is, every good boy does fine. Alternatively, feel free to come up with your own, like, excited gorillas break dance flawlessly. For the bass clef, you could use a mnemonic for the spaces like, all cows eat grass, or all cats eat goldfish, which they definitely would if given the chance. For the lines, a common option is good boys do fine always, but if you happen to find great big dragons from Alberta to be a bit more memorable, that's fine too. Finally, here's a couple of mnemonic options for the alto clef. Whether you prefer repetition, a touchstone note, or a mnemonic device, learning to quickly and accurately name notes is an important skill for musicians. There's just a few other rules for note naming. They mostly have to do with accidentals, which is another name for sharps and flats. First, although we talk about sharp and flat notes by saying the letter and then the accidental, like C sharp and A flat, it's actually written on the staff with the accidental before the note. It's a bit like how most currencies are written. We say $100, but write the dollar sign before the number. If you turned it around, it would look pretty weird. Another important rule is that accidentals last for the whole bar. So, if you have an F-sharp here, any F for the rest of the bar is also sharp. It's a lot easier to read this, knowing that all the Fs are sharp, rather than this, which is way more cluttered. When we get to the bar line, any accidentals that were in the previous bar no longer apply. So the Fs are sharp in the first bar, but in the second bar, they're just regular F. If you did want to have a sharp note followed by a regular note in the same bar, we use a third type of accidental called the natural. It looks like this, and it refers to the regular and unaltered note, not sharp or flat. So you might see something like this. If you wanted to switch back and forth between a sharp or flat note and its natural, it could get a little cluttered and difficult to read. But if you'll remember that some notes have two names, like D sharp and E flat, as well as F sharp and G flat, you can rewrite these bars like this, which is a lot easier to read but still sounds the same. The last thing is something called key signatures which are a musical notation that indicate which notes are sharp or flat in a piece of music. For instance, this says that all Bs, Es, and As are flat. A notation like this affects all these notes. However, any note can be changed by adding accidentals, which would override the key signature. And that's just about everything you need to know about note naming. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And check the description for links to more videos. Thanks for watching.